Good afternoon, colleagues, and, and welcome to uh, yet another in-house uh, council series uh, brought to you courtesy of uh, East Africa Law Society. Um, as we begin, we just want to make sure that uh, the IT is working well. So please uh, make use of that function in uh, the chat and just uh, let us know where you're dialing in uh, from. Um, my co-moderator and I are immensely privileged uh, and honored to be part of this uh, conversation uh, with a distinguished uh, uh, panel of colleagues uh, who will be uh, introducing shortly. Uh, without taking much time, um, let me uh, take this opportunity to introduce my co-moderator, Annabel uh, Mwesije Mwine. Annabel is a legal and compliance officer with uh, Vision Group. Uh, areas of practice are legal and regulatory compliance, corporate governance, contract management, data protection management, uh, and, and the like. Annabel has also had a stint in private practice where she worked as an advocate with KBW Advocates. She has served on various bar committees, notably the East Africa Women Committee and the in-house committee uh, for East Africa Law Society. Annabel, you're most welcome. Uh, looking forward to co-moderating this with you. Uh, I'll introduce myself. Uh, my name is uh, Chris Ingolo Tiek. Uh, I am a banking and financial attorney uh, currently uh, with Standard Chartered Bank, based out of our regional office in Nairobi. I am a senior legal counsel looking after our client coverage, corporate, commercial, and institutional banking as part of the regional team of colleagues covering Africa and Middle East. I am also fortunate to have uh, begun my career in private practice uh, in SNL Advocates. Uh, many of you would know that as formerly several only advocates, uh, DLA Piper affiliate firm before I transitioned into the uh, in-house role. I'm uh, dialing in from Kampala uh, where I am uh, visiting shortly and uh, looking forward to uh, this engagement. Uh, I will just uh, kindly cue in uh, my colleague Annabel to kindly uh, introduce our panelists for the day. Uh, Annabel, uh, please uh, go ahead. Thank you very much, Chris. Good afternoon to you all. Um, like Chris has rightly said, I will be introducing our speakers for the day. For our webinar today, we have three esteemed speakers. Um, one, uh, the first one being Balance Rukesha, our second being Anthony Mkulun Shinye, and Deborah Adit Ajwang, who will be joining us shortly. So I will introduce all three of our speakers as a go, and I will request that um, I see all our videos are on, but maybe once I finish reading your bio, you could maybe wave so that people can tell <laughs> the difference, and uh, at least um, place a face to the name. Uh, hopefully we're all okay with that. All right, so I'm going to begin with Mr. Anthony uh, Anthony is a seasoned lawyer with a vast experience in finance dispute resolution, business transactions, investment, trade, poli trade policy and trade law, procurement, corporate governance, and construction and energy. He's currently the chief legal officer and company secretary of Rwanda Finance Limited and responsible for legal advisory, regulation, and compliance. Prior to joining Rwanda Finance Limited, Anthony worked at the Ministry of Justice uh, in the Attorney Chamber, General's Chambers from 2008 to 2019, where he rose to the position of Senior State Attorney. Anthony holds a Master's of Science in International Trade Policy and Trade Law from Lundi University, Sweden, and a Master's of Law in Business, Corporate, and Maritime Law from Erasmus University in the Netherlands. He also holds a Bachelor's of Law, a degree from the, from, Uganda, from the Uganda Christian University, as well as a diploma in legal practice from the Institute of Legal Practice and Development in Rwanda. You're welcome, Ms. Anthony. I'll uh, go to our second speaker, Mr. Valence um, Kesha. Valence Kesha is a senior attorney at a senior associate at um, ENS Africa Rwanda, specializing in banking and finance, dispute resolution, 
land law and insolvency administration. Before joining Ines, Valens worked at EcoBank Branda as senior legal officer and deputy head, um, legal, uh, the deputy head legal and company secretary. He has a wealth of experience in the financial world coming from um, the several positions he has held in different institutions, including KCB Bank and Randa Development Board. Um, you must welcome Mr. Kesha. Our third speaker for the day is Deborah Andit Ajuang. Um, she'll be joining us um, in a few minutes, but I will either way still um, read her her profile. Ms. Deborah Jung is an advocate of the High Court of Kenya and currently serves as the company secretary and head of legal at Jubilee Alliance General Insurance Kenya Limited. She's a highly experienced and decorated in-house counsel who has served in a number of blue chip companies in Kenya, holding several key positions holding, including as head of legal and company secretary, UBA Bank, Company Secretary at Stanib, um, Legal Manager at uh, Cooperative Bank of Kenya, and Legal Manager at KCB Bank. Uh, she specializes in corporate governance, legal compliance, regulatory compliance, team management and teamwork, mentoring, legal advice, research, legal writing, internal controls, and contract writing. She, was, she has recently been nominated to serve as the chair of the ELS Banking and Finance Committee Education. Mr. Jung is a certified public secretary and holds a, a bachelor's of law from Moi, Moi University. She has numerous other professional certifications. I will hand back over to you, Chris. Thank you uh, very much, uh, Annabelle, uh, for that very uh, eloquent uh, introduction. Um, I've seen something on the chat that the panelists are not being seen. Uh, no worries, we will put a spotlight on them uh, when they start to speak uh, for those who are not able to see them yet. Um, so let, let's get into the setting of the context uh, of the discussion. And I would be coming to Anthony uh, in a bit, but before I do that, um, you know, when I was reflecting on, on the topic for the discussion, uh, I thought to sort of keep an open uh, mind and, and my mind uh, when we talk about pioneering in uncharted waters, my mind uh, was cast to to fiction uh, and the fiction within the context of uh, one of the very popular movies, uh, Pirates of the Caribbean, uh, which I hope many of you uh, have watched. Uh, specifically, how you know the mischievous Captain Jack Sparrow uh, gets on a voyage in unexplored waters uh, to rescue. Uh, kidnapped Elizabeth Swan from a cast uh, crew on a fiction ship called Black Pearl. Again, a lot of fiction, but there was a lot of stuff that happened, you know, in that in that movie uh, that, that that in my mind uh, sort of relates to this topic. But let's step away from fiction and, and, and sort of come back into you know more serious matters. Uh, as I reflect further, I think the the past two years um, I've, I've seen you know. Uh, the economies coming out of the global pandemic, which really tested, you know, the fragilities of, of our emerging markets. Um, you know, post 2020 into 2021, uh, there was a bit of a bullish look in the economy, uh, with the, the economy starting to look like it's uh, going to recover. Um, but again, there have been a number of headwinds that have continued to hit uh, that global outlook. Uh, when you look at things like inflationary pressures, uh, escalation of the geopolitical tensions, and you know the the, the various mutations of the COVID nineteen pandemic uh, in China, uh, I spoke about the the Ukraine conflict as well and and the pressure that it has you know on the commodity prices, and when you look at all that, it's it's certainly going to have an impact. Uh, on you know the world economy, which uh, initially had been pro, pro projected or estimated to grow at about six, you know, point one percent. Now, even if you're the most optimistic person, I think the World Bank through IMF has reported that the growth is going to be about you know three point six uh, percent. 
Now, these uh, macroeconomic issues and geopolitical tensions, uh, to my mind, have created a new normal, an environment that has brought uh, emerging client needs, right? And it's challenging on how we approach business, you know, how we, we, we approach our governance, how we leverage uh, on technology, to collaborate uh, both internally and, and also out of the organization to be able to serve our clients. Uh, businesses have had to innovate uh, in developing new product lines and to be able to remain afloat. And as in-house counsel uh, who are an integral part of the business and who uh, looked, to pro looked, looked at to provide uh, solutions, you know, you, you have to first, you know, ride the tide in the first instance uh, in those waters that are uncharted and then delve into the granularity of, you know, the bespoke matters in order to be able to support your business colleagues uh, who continue to grapple. Um, that's my reflection uh, in terms of when I, when I think about this topic. And I'll just ask, you know, uh, all our you participants to just drop in the chat just a few, few lines of what they, their reflections on the topic are. So if I can just come to you, uh, Anthony, um, to just check, uh, you know, what are your kind of your reflections uh, about the topic of, of discussion on, on pioneering in uncharted waters? I mean, what, what, what does it mean to you? Thank you. Thank you, Chris. And uh, thank you, Annabelle, for moderating this session. Good afternoon to our listeners. Now, when I looked at the topic that we are discussing uh, today, one is that it's important with the context that Chris has provided, especially with uh, post-COVID. It's important that as in-house counsel, you know how to navigate the corporate governance aspect. And when you talk about corporate governance, you bring into play issues to do with uh, structuring. Uh, definitely many companies have uh, made uh, losses. How are you going to keep afloat and again deliver on your mandate in these tough times? So these more or less call for uh, tough decisions. And uh, as in-house council, I believe these are areas that we help uh, management on one hand and also the board, especially those that uh, double as a head of ego and company secretary uh, to say, we are facing this, how can we move forward? Uh, we have uh, you'd have employees on board, you have different ongoing contracts that uh, you'd have to find ways of uh, uh, navigating uh, those that you have to drop and those that, that you have to keep running uh, to ensure that as a company, you continue to deliver on your mandate. So in a nutshell, that's what I would uh, want to basically give the context of this uh, topic, uh, given that we are facing different challenges. So how, how are you going to navigate through them? Thank you. Great, uh, and thanks, Anthony. And, and I like the fact that you also uh, sort of speak to the ecosystem, uh, you know, when you bring in the aspects of, you know, the stakeholders that are involved, uh, you know, in that ecosystem. And I just wanted to just sort of turn to, to, to Valence. Uh, uh, it would be very, very, very good to, to get your, your thoughts or insights uh, in terms of, you know, what your reflections are on the topic of discussion. Thank you so much, Chris. And um, uh, thank you, Annabelle. Uh, maybe also to add on what uh, my colleague Anthony has said. Um, I would give an experience, uh, maybe during COVID-19, and then I would talk very uh, briefly about uh, the post-COVID-19, for, for example. So anyway, in as, in as far as the topic is concerned, uh, when I was reflecting on this, um, I thought of uh, the uh, post-COVID uh, situation, but, but also the uh, situation uh, during COVID-19 itself when it was a bit tough. 
And also the second thing I thought about was um, uh, an environment where there are many dynamic uh, changes in um, legal and regulatory framework, uh, also given the dynamics that are in, um, you know, in business uh, in general. So to begin with um, the COVID-19, I remember when we were working from home and um, um, you know, banks kept on you know, doing some work uh, in terms of uh, restructuring facilities. And I remember I was always called on when I was at EcoBank to uh, provide legal opinion on every file. So what that required it was to you know look into the, um, the files that we are requiring um, um, restructuring and uh, you know needing um, grace periods and uh, you know um, all, all of that you know uh, you know there were a lot of things and even I remember some uh, clients were tending to call this um, COVID nineteen uh, and. Um, um uh, what we call um false majeure in uh, in in french and we were also we are supposed to advise on that advising management and the board on why on how these facilities should be should should be handled and we are facility where facilities also had securities or collaterals that we are covering the the facilities also to know whether if we allow um restructuring of the facilities would also go ahead and um, update the securities or the mortgages uh, within uh, the mortgage registry. So that is something that will, that, that required, you know, um, amid this COVID-19 and what was going on, um, you know, uh, being able to advise, advise on the legal documentation that would be required, uh, look at the central bank, uh, you know, guidelines on the treatment of facilities and all that. So. Um, it is something you know that required looking at all these um, situational dynamics, and 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 you know advice on what should be done. So that required you know reading and, and and following up on the government instructions and all that, and and also keeping an eye on what the central bank provides. So, um, but also there are there are you know always situations where. At the in-house as in-house councils, we find there is a you know a lot to look at, update, know what is happening, look at the uh, changes in the legal and regulatory form framework, keep an eye on you know the different uh, you know um, aspects uh, you know uh, uh, um, you know uh, aspects related to uh, changes in the corporate governance in general, what is happening in terms of uh, um, the corporate governance structures and um, and all that. So when I was was reflecting on this, uh, you know, what comes to my mind is, you know, are you being able to navigate through all that and ensure that the decisions made will not have a negative uh, impacts or implications on uh, on the business. So uh, and being able to advise, you know, properly, uh, the, the to, to to orient what the decision should be in as far as uh, working on, on, on such um, situations is concerned. So that, that's how, what I, I, I would really um, give as, as, as um, uh, in as far as understanding the context is concerned. Thank you. Thanks, uh, uh, Valence, for, for that very useful uh, reflection. And I would probably pick, you know, uh, some of the things that you said, which, which I think in summary, I really speak to you know very many moving parts uh, happening at the same time, and, and and you being able to sort of navigate through uh, the complexities. And I'll just be going back to to Anthony a bit, um, you know, to just sort of speak uh, you know more about that. And I think there's a quote recently that I read, which talked about uh, headwinds. And I think you know what the gist of that quote was was that you know when you run against a headwind your speed slows down and you have to push harder. Uh, but uh, you feel, uh, you know, the headwind as you sort of run towards it. But when you have a tailwind, uh, tailwind pushing uh, you, it's, it's a force that propels you forward. I, I think in there, there is uh, a challenge and then there's also an opportunity uh, to be able to, uh, you know, leverage on, on what that experience sort of brings to you. So Anthony, uh, 
what I just wanted to just, uh, you know, sort of pick your brains for, for all of us who have uh, sort of dialed in is, you know, what are the type of headwinds that you, you experienced in, in that voyage or that you continue to experience in that voyage uh, as you sort of go through the un unexplored waters? Thank you, Chris. So where I want to first uh, start with, and maybe I'll uh, uh, direct my discussion to the impact of uh, COVID-19. Now, one of the issues that I would want to speak to as in-house legal counsel, and again, these are aspects that you find on the job, and I believe many of the uh, my learned friends uh, that are listening in, these are some of the, uh, I would say the headwinds uh, they meet. Uh, because previously in my work at the Attorney General's uh, Chamber, these are not aspects that I was associated with. Now, as in-house legal counsel, one of the aspects that I've met or uh, had to experience when I joined uh, Rwanda Finance is that one, when you double as a chief legal officer and company secretary, you have the aspect of um, as chief legal officer to advise uh, management on a number of uh, aspects that are cross cut. You have also that role as company secretary, and here you're more aligned to the board. You're the key person that will ensure that they are aligned to the respective rules in their decision-making. So most of the time, you don't get to learn this. Uh, definitely we have uh, courses on corporate governance uh, that you can always uh, pick a few ideas here and there, but the practice is different. So most of the time, your allegiance is tested uh, because you have management on one side and you have the board on the other side and you're the same person juggling this. So from my own experience, I've, I've come to see that it's important from the onset uh, to be someone of character. It's okay to advise one party being management and the board and also tell them, no, this is wrong, this is right, you should align here and there. So that's one element that I would want uh, the listeners to understand. Most of the time, I've, I've listened to a number of discussions where this topic keeps on coming, whether someone can have a dual function. But from my experience, I believe you can, but you just have to stick to your personality and character. So you don't need to bend any corner. So if you need to say this is wrong, this is wrong from the onset. And one thing from my experience that I've also learned is that once you stick to what are the rules are and you provide good advice, those that you're advising will respect you. And when you earn that respect, then everything becomes smooth. So that's one area that I just wanted to touch on as I was uh, uh, answering to the question, Chris, that you put across. Now, when we bring the, the context of um, uh, post-COVID, one of the challenges, of course, has been how do companies uh, restructure to move forward. But I've, again, the opportunities that we see out of here is that through the different IT systems that are in place, uh, for us at Rwanda Finance, uh, we use a lot of um, uh, IT systems and platforms that have been in place, but we have also um, had others on board. And this has been very critical in uh, navigating uh, the post-COVID impact. One is efficiency, and uh, definitely we have had a number of uh, uh, cost cutting here and there. So on that element, it's one of the key issues that as colleagues on this call, it's one of the areas that you have to look out for to make you more efficient going forward. Thank you, Chris. 
Thanks, uh, Anthony. If I could just, uh, you know, just sort of kindly follow up on, on that. Um, you know, you touched on uh, the aspect of, of double hatting, you know, learning on the job. Uh, I like, you know, what, what you said about being an independent guardian to the business uh, or a business partner and being able to earn that respect as in house counsel uh, uh, on it. Just if we could just sort of unpack that uh, a little more. Um, you know, from a skills perspective, you know, what are some of the, the skills that you sort of uh, have felt that continue to enable you to be able to engage? Is it, as it were, you know, the formal, you know, uh, studies? Is it, is it the soft skills? Um, um, you know, just quit, just uh, keen on, on, on hearing, uh, you know, what your thoughts around uh, that are, Anthony. Thank you, Chris. So first and foremost, where I want to start from, education is key in acquiring skills that we use in our everyday work. So that's an element that I would want to start with to encourage everyone. There are a number of um, uh, courses out there on corporate governance. It's important that at least uh, on an annual basis, you keep on uh, uh, getting more knowledge in this area. So on that, it's important to acquire knowledge, to understand how to navigate. Now, I also want to move on the practical side of, of things, how they're done. In navigating the two hearts uh, that you referred to, it's important to have interpersonal skills. And here, it's not enough to be a good advisor as most of colleagues uh, do, it's one thing to say, reach out to a director, uh, reach out to a colleague in management and understand and maybe explain more because at times we can be good at providing good legal opinions and you leave it at that, but you have not understood where the other person is coming from, or they don't understand the advice you've provided. So it's important to have check-ins, uh, be it with the directors, which is uh, best practice, and uh, also management to bring everything into context. Uh, so when you more or less uh, uh, double the knowledge and also bring in the interpersonal uh, skills into play, then you would, uh, find some of these uh, challenges easy to navigate going forward. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thanks, thanks, Anthony. Uh, when, when you spoke uh, about um, being able to give advice to our stakeholders or I think our key clients who are our internal business colleagues or even our clients, uh, my mind was cast back recently to an engagement that we had with our new uh, general counsel and she uh, sort of decried the need for uh, in-house counsel or, or generally lawyers to just try and keep communications uh, very simple. Um, and she specifically talked about, you know, use of Latin. Um, you know, we're very good scholars of Latin, uh, always cannot resist the temptation of putting in an ipso facto or ipso jure uh, in a letter or in an advice. But I think that coming from, from someone who uh, has worked at a very high level uh, to, 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 to come and say, you know, ultimately for our clients, all they just need is basic, simple uh, advice that, that we can communicate to them in a way that we do. As between counsel, I mean, not a problem if you want to go and, uh, you know, have your letter uh, full with uh, Latin uh, maxims, that's, that's up to you really uh, to scare the other side. But I think, you know, bringing it closer home to, to being able to add the value uh, that we do, um, uh, in our work, I think is something that I thought I should also share. But uh, let's let's just get back to 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 Valence, uh, uh, just to sort of pick up from from where Anthony left us off, and and just for you to cue in within the the context of it, it, it's obviously a fast paced environment. Um, I know in your time in Equibank there were a lot of uh, complexities with regulation with stakeholders. 
um, uh, having to engage to leverage uh, to sort of lobby. Uh, I mean, how 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 were you able to adapt, or how have you been able to adopt, uh, even as you transition into private practice? But but how have you been able to adapt uh, to sort of keep that ship uh, on the voyage and avoid the strategic drift? Because we have a strategy that we are there to deliver, uh, but then you know you have to take a few steps to get to the strategy. So uh, Valence, uh, how have you been able to to go through that? Thank you, Chris. Um, that's, uh, I think, is a very good question. Uh, maybe to begin with some experience, when I was um, at uh, KCB, now BPR, I, I, that's when, when I started, uh, I would say, having interactions with uh, uh, my colleagues uh, across the group, um, you know, guys from Kenya, you know, and some other places where KCB is. And, um, and, and also uh, speaking with the business guys, guys from credit, from business and all that. And um, there are, of course, there are things that were quite alien to me. And, uh, you know, sometimes, you know, when you, you are a lawyer, you feel that what you should know is all about law. But when you are working in a business environment, you're working with business guys and you need to understand, you know, to draft because I was um, heading a unit of um, uh, securities and documentation. So I would uh, go into uh, documentation of credit files and all that. So I started feeling that uh, maybe I am substandard because of course I, I knew the law, I knew the procedure, I, you know, uh, all of that. I had gone to school of, uh, of law, but I started feeling that I'm, I'm substandard because I could not speak the language that, um, that the business guys were speaking. So they tell you things and you feel you don't even understand. So that's when I started feeling the need, the urge within me that I need to go for, for some courses. So that's when I started uh, registering for an LLM in, in business law and, and also uh, going for uh, um, arbitration, you know, going for, uh, for these other courses that would uh, allow, allow me to, you know, or introduce me to a lot of other aspects that are, that are in business. Now, when I got to Ecobank, it even became, I would say, more complex because I would go to a lot of um, cross-border transactions, have discussions with guys at the group that are managing um, global clients, you know, have discussions about, um, you know, cross-border documentation, about corporate, uh, about corporate um, guarantees or parent company guarantees, uh, look at things related to, um, you know, all these other documents when it comes to syndicated lending, you know, some of the terms in the, in, you know, in that complexity of uh, documentation, you find that all these, you know, are things that you really know a uh, little about. So now that required that, you know, I try to, to, you know, take advantage of anything that I find, you know, in as far as, you know, uh, courses are concerned, you know, started looking into which course can I go for? Can I go for maybe a course, uh, you know, related to corporate governance, like we're going for, uh, you know, the CASNEB uh, courses about the certified um, uh, company secretaries, or going for ICSA uh, certified uh, uh, secretaries and, and administrators. I was even at one point tempted to go for, you know, the CC, the uh, chartered uh, securities and investment, you know, looking at all that uh, and, and at all that. And also by then, I think uh, around 2015, I had not yet done the postgraduate diploma in legal practice. So I felt the need to go for, you know, all these courses, although some of course, some of them, there were challenges that, you know, maybe time, you know, managing time and um, even financing, you know, of those courses and all that. But, you know, I always have had the need to, you know, move out of this comfort zone and, and you know, feel that, that I'm a lawyer, I can, you know, speak the Latin, you know, uh, speak the Latin or, you know, put it in all the, you know, all those legal jargons and all that, but felt the need to go also for, for these courses. And that's where I, when I even ended up uh, registering for the certified professional banker course, and people were telling me I may not even manage it because there are, uh, you know, courses to do with financial analysis, you know, you know, like um, economic, you know, things to do with economics and all that. But, you know, 
I just felt that even as I prepare to be an um, to be a practitioner, you know, in a, in a law firm or you know, going private, you know, all that. As I think about all this, I need to find out how I can speak the same language as uh, as my clients would speak. So I think um, going for such courses is one of the things that that, that, that helped me to you know remain relevant, but also ensure that. Um, when you know when the board the board members speak about the numbers at least i can understand i don't know the experience of um of anthony but you know when you go to the boardroom and they are you know speaking a language that you don't understand you know about speaking to numbers and uh, and you know the financial statements i don't understand these things you know it even becomes difficult for you to 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 get a very good minutes and on, and also ensure that what, what you, you're following up on the board discussions. So one of the things that really helped me, you know, of course, with challenges is, you know, going for courses and also, you know, going for any workshop, any seminar that, that, that I would find across in, uh, in you know, in, in, in as far as the professional life is concerned. So that, that's, that's what I did to ensure that, you know, I, I go through, I navigate through these uh, headwinds. Thank you. Thanks, uh, thanks, Valence. And I think uh, the challenge there is about uh, really growth, uh, growth mindset, and being able to understand, uh, you know, the business that we, uh, you know, we practice in or we operate in. And uh, I think you're not alone if you speak about you know, sort of the fright for numbers. Uh, I think we we don't have a very good reputation as as, as lawyers uh, in terms of of grinding uh, the numbers and 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 my. Just, just like you have said, you know, my mind is also cast back, you know, many, many years ago. And I, I thank uh, one of my very first uh, people leaders who uh, sort of threw me in the deep end uh, to go and att attend, you know, various exco meetings. And, and one of the first reports was, you know, the financial report. And, you know, the financial statement was put before. And you'd hear the uh, CFO, you know, going through and talking about things like, NII, NFI, uh, you know, that we're having positive jaws, uh, you know, and it, that, that really, really terrified me for those meetings. And, and, and just like you, I, I challenged myself to be able to understand or to learn more about the balance sheet of, 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 of the company that I operate in. Uh, just realize that NII is actually net interest income, which is a key revenue, uh, you know, uh, line for, 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 for the bank. NFI, you know, net non-financial non income and the like. So uh, I think there's a lot of, um, you know, merit in, in trying to uh, challenge ourselves to grow uh, more. And before I just go to, to Anthony, uh, Valence, I'll just come back to you a bit. Uh, I think you touched on it to some extent, but I think we'd want to hear from you more uh, in terms of, you know, how uh, your ability to challenge yourself to, to grow to be able to uh, look for some of these courses that are relevant to the area of your practice. Um, we just want to understand, I mean, did, did that also change the nature of the uh, legal advice or the way you are engaging with your internal stakeholders uh, sort of once you had acquired that skill? Uh, Valens? Uh, thank you so much, Chris. Um, Maybe I, I would go to the very, I would say recent, when I was, when I started doing the um, a certified professional banker course, uh, as well as uh, even when I was done with it. Uh, I would say maybe, you know, uh, when people talk about uh, someone being born again. So uh, I would say uh, the way I started approaching the advice I, I should give, the way I started looking at business, you know, uh, this, the, 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 the training I got from the certified professional bank course alone, living, living alone, all these other things, I think is something that made a very um, a big difference in what I was doing. Because I started understanding the business uh, in terms of profitability, in terms of, you know, um, not only legal uh, and, and maybe compliance risk, but also these other risks that I would never have understood if I, if I had not taken that course. Looking at the financial statements and understanding what they imply, the, the I mean the implication to the business. Uh, looking at um, 
what what, what the, the um the value of what i do as a minerals council in terms of numbers in terms of business you know uh, you know makes you not only uh, you know um, a, a legal advisor in terms of you know strictly uh, providing legal advice but also uh, providing the legal advice that is very well informed in terms of in terms of the 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 the, the company's business so like looking at you know what 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 can we what can can the company do what is what will, will the decision look like uh, for example you know where there is some conflicting uh, i would say interests in terms of your know, conflicting i would say conflicting uh, decisions where where can, how can one uh, um, you know uh, be able to decide uh, to make a decision that will that will um, you know make a, a big impact or a better impact on the business. So you know, um, for example, you know, uh, uh, knowing uh, you know what what would what, what in terms of uh, because in that course there is also um, uh, management practices uh, and, and strategic strategic ma uh, marketing, for example, marketing management, and also knowing those, you know, financial, uh, you know, lending, you know, all those courses. So it, it, it takes you to a level where you would sit with a managing director or even with a board member, with the head of credit or a head of, you know, corporate or head of business, uh, or maybe someone that heads a marketing, um, a marketing department and when you speak you are then uh, you have the heart of the business and the heart of uh, of, of of law or of legal a legal advisor then it becomes easy for you to even understand the 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 the, the member of uh, you know or the colleague uh, from, from from their perspective as as you also think at the the other risks that are involved in the business so that is something that um you know led to a lot of impact in the way i was advising and also the way I, was, I would understand the business by looking at the other risk but also looking at the legal uh, and compliance risk so it, it it really um added a lot of value in the way i was advising uh the 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 business or the the company in terms of you know decision making uh, uh for example where they are they are, they are conflicting, I would say, rules or practices. So I would say um, it made you know it made a, a complete you know difference in uh, in what in what I was in what I was doing and, and in terms of the way I was advising, but also um, also trying to be able to manage stakeholders, also advising confidently because sometimes when you know that there are things that you do not master in terms of business and there there is a hidden area that you do not know it becomes difficult for you to advise confidently you know you, you know uh you know uh, because you know if, if you know the business and and you can you can discuss you know uh, freely with uh the guys uh in in the other segments and the other uh, functions then it becomes easier for you to 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 give a confident opinion to open on something with confidence thank you Brilliant, uh, brilliant, uh, uh, Valens. And, and and just to sort of cast my eyes a little bit to the chat, uh, uh, please keep those comments uh, and questions coming through. Uh, indeed, uh, Anna, the uh, Annabelle, I think the sitting in finance uh, meetings is very humbling. Uh, JB uh, has, has also uh, commented on climate change, which is also another uh, new thing that we're grappling with. And I think you know the, the the challenge is that uh is that we're always very reactive and, and and non not proactive in terms of having appropriate legal tools to guide and advise the clients to mitigate uh, these effects the ability to predict and prepare ourselves are non-existent and africa has been a shock a shock absorber of the external shocks because you know we have no appropriate tools to push on uh, these e effects uh Good, good question. A good challenge. Um, Valence and, uh, and and Anthony just just sort of reflect on on the, the issue around climate climate change, but but generally around um, you know all, all, all the new complexities that we have to deal with, especially with the uniqueness that we have uh, in Africa. I, I think a very interesting statistic that I came across uh, recently was that you know the 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 the, the effect that you know, from all the, the, the operations that we do in, in this part of the continent and the contribution of, uh, you know, whatever, whether it's mining, it's, uh, you know, crude oil or all 
those activities that form part of the GDP. We, we have a very small, I think up to 10% uh, contribution globally in terms of climate, uh, climate change. So it, that's also a very uh, interesting discussion, I'm sure, um, you know, uh, David, CEO and um, Gloria who were listening in would, 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 would uh, prepare an appropriate you know, webinar for us to engage. But, but I'll just come to, to, to Anthony uh, to just think about that and, and sort of share your reflection. But before you, you do, Anthony, um, Anthony and, and, and I, we, we, we went to school together uh, many years ago and sort of looking at his bio, I was, I was really amazed at how much he's been able to, you know, upskill um, and be uh, able to be a, dyna a dynamic uh, lawyer that is sort of transitioning from, you know, Minister of Justice to Attorney General's Chambers. And, and, and then, you know, into uh, private uh, banking. And so, uh, Anthony, if, if, if I may just ask, uh, I'll just be interested in getting you, your thoughts around, you know, your approach uh, in how that reskilling risk and retooling has helped you to be able to understand the business that you are in more and, and be able to be that, uh, you know, uh, business partner that, that our clients always uh, crave for. Anthony? Thank you, Chris. Uh, so you've, uh, you've touched on something that is so passionate uh, to me. Those that I engage with on a daily basis, I always um, uh, tell them that you should never have a dead yap for upskilling because in this world we are in that transforms uh, at a speed that you can't control. You can't afford to spend a whole year without even having a one week training. Again, when I talk of uh, upskilling, I'm not talking about uh, the long term courses that you feel you are busy, no, even if it's one week, because you always have that. I need to get more understanding. And that's where as in-house uh, counsel, we have to focus. You can't advise in an area you don't understand. But again, it's also important to have passion in what you're doing. So you asked about um, uh, the different uh, qualifications that I've undertaken. Uh, over time, if you look at the areas that um, uh, come from uh, business to trade uh, uh, related uh, aspects. It's important now at Rwanda Finance, uh, those who don't know Rwanda Finance, we are the promotional agency of, uh, uh, that is developing uh, the establishment of Kigali International Financial Center. So we are ensuring that we use Kigali as a hub for investments, uh, both within Rwanda and uh, uh, Africa at large. Now, when you look at the different uh, products that we deal in and the structuring of these products, if you talk about uh, the holding companies, uh, all the SPVs that can be uh, used for structuring, it's important that as in-house counsel, it's one thing to have the legal background. It's another thing where you're working, it's important to understand the environment you're in. And you say, what is the mandate of this company? How far with my knowledge do I understand all these aspects? And then you move on to break it down to say, in three years, I want to get here. Yeah, I know we are busy. So again, I'm mindful that you can't keep on being engaged the whole year studying, but it's important to more or less have a roadmap to say, these are areas that I need to understand. You talked about uh, the financial uh, aspects of, of interpreting uh, the different uh, financial statements that are put there. So if you have issues with uh, numbers, do this now. On my part, uh, leave alone the, uh, the other, legal knowledge that I've carried all through. When I joined Rwanda Finance, I realized that I've not had any background 
as a company secretary in practice because that I was purely in uh, advisory uh, way back in the attorney general's chamber. So I looked at my role as company secretary to say, okay, what does it entail? And uh, among the things you've talked about are uh, financial statements. So I realized these are areas that I need to educate myself more. And uh, as I speak now, I'm undertaking the Chartered Company Secretaries and Administrators Program. And that's one of the areas that I, on a personal level, I need to upskill myself because you need, get to understand the financial analysis uh, part of it. You, you also get to understand aspects of, for example, board dynamics because you can have directors and everyone has their strengths and weakness. But again, this is a team that has to move forward. So these are areas that, again, you're not prepared for. It's important to understand how you'll uh, put that teamwork collaboration to ensure that uh, work is done, but uh, in a way that is professional. So this comes with, uh, uh, with the upskilling. So on the aspect on uh, climate uh, change, I believe these, this has been a topic out there, but I would say a number of um, uh, companies and by policies, they don't really uh, follow through on this. So these are elements that now are very critical. Uh, for example, the aspect of what is uh, the impact of the decisions that are taken uh, within uh, Rwanda finance. Again, we have to look at the, what will be the impact to these other stakeholders. So these um, aspects that we have put in place in our policies, so it's one thing to make a decision, but what is its impact? So we also focus on, uh, on uh, climate uh, change uh, aspects and again sustainability. So this one area that I would want to encourage uh, colleagues to to walk the talk. So any decision you make, you also tie it down to its impact. And uh, I believe that's how we can answer some of these uh, uh, issues on climate change. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Anthony. I'll just ask uh, uh, both you and Valens to just keep your uh, cameras on. Uh, I think we've, 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 we've seen the participants want to see uh, your faces uh, uh, in real time. So just kind of keep you, your cameras uh, on. Um, Annabelle, uh, just let us know if uh, there, there are any questions that we need to look at in the chat. Um, and then we can come back uh, to that. Yeah, we do have maybe two questions. So I, I don't know if we could Maybe we'd answer those first and then proceed with the conversation. Sure. Yeah. So there is one that came in in the Q&A section uh, that I'll read verbatim. Um, and it reads, it would be useful to hear how colleagues manage to keep abreast with the fast changing legal and regulatory environment without being over-reliant on external counsel. That would be the first question. Then the second one was directed to, to Valence. And uh, let me see. Um, he's asking, Andre is asking what the name of the certified banking course you talked about is called. Um, Great. Uh, thanks, thanks, uh, Annabelle. So, so Valence, we'll just come to you in a bit on, 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 on both of those questions. Um, I think the first one was around, you know, a lot of change happening, uh, as, as, as you know, from, from your background, in-house in -house teams are normally extremely lean uh, in numbers. Um, there's, you know, sort of push from the businesses to get more from less. Um, and yet, you know, you are also constantly being put under pressure to advise on, on, on things that are, continuing to come through either through policy and through regulation. Uh, as you also move into uh, now private practice, I mean, what, how, how have you yourself been able to, um, you know, uh, navigate 
a scenario whereby you having to run all those late hours to, you know, get the board packs, you know, ready or attend to some urgent client needs, but while at the same time being able to, you know, look into the law and, and appraise yourself uh, with the areas that are very critical to uh, the business that you support. Uh, thank you so much, Chris and uh, Annabelle, uh, and thank you for the questions to, uh, you know, thanking our, our listeners. Now, to begin with, uh, maybe, uh, you know, just clear this off. Um, the course is called Certified Professional Banker Course. It is offered by the uh, Uganda Institute of uh, Banking and Financial Services. So, um, you know, if when you go to their website, you find a number of courses and you can choose that one. Um, the curriculum is by the African Alliance of Banking and Financial Services, but you know this was formerly an affiliate of the um, uh, Chartered uh, Institute of uh, or Chartered Banking Institute. So when you go to the website of the um, Uganda Institute of Banking and Financial Services, you get a number of courses, and that one is uh, one of them. It's actually one level, the first level to the chartered banker uh, course, and um, I think it is not even expensive. So you can, you can, you guys can go for it. It's it's a good one for me. It's really a good one for lawyers. Not very difficult, but it opens you to uh, a, a lot of you know. Um, uh, banking and, and financial uh, stuff, but, but also business in general. So that is it. And now going to the second question on, uh, you know, how we can uh, navigate through the, you know, changes in, in the legal and regulatory framework. Um, I remember when I went, uh, when I came from university in 2009, I mean, I, I, I completed in 2008, and around that time, there was a, a legal reform of, um, of, of the legal uh, framework related to, uh, to business, uh, doing business in Rwanda. And I remember many of the laws were, were, were new. You know, I, were, they had been reformed, and, and there were very many um, acts, you know, related to business and uh, the the institution also that that that, that you know in, that is in charge of doing business rdb was also uh, put in place around that time and that's when i became i, I was uh, you know i began my career as you know um i mean I, I would say even that's when i began you know my 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 working you know uh, professional professionally and um, so that required me, number one, of course, uh, amidst a lot of, uh, you know, busy, uh, you know, work and all that. That's when I started uh, looking at these laws. Some of these laws, I would say most of them had not uh, seen them at school. So what did that require? That required, you know, um, getting to know the laws in the first place, you know, asking, getting a call, you know, visiting a friend or a colleague, asking them, you know, about the new laws and all that, but also going for any training that one would come across. Of course, of course, it may not be difficult, it may not be easy always to go for, um, for trainings, but whenever you hear of one, then you go and check, and then also asking friends. Now, um, when I was uh, recently, when I was uh, still at, um, uh, at, at Echo Bank, um, I'm lucky that I was also chairing the legal committee of uh, Rwanda Bankers Association. So that put me in, um, in, in a situation or in a seat where uh, I would, you know, be able to fall on or to fall up on these and uh, on these changes, you know, get informed. But that was not enough. That required me also to make arrangements for trainings. So um, trainings are key. Um, you know, uh, when the banking law, the new banking law, uh, the law governing banking came in place in 2017, uh, it um, provided for a number of regulations. I think more than 30 uh, new regulations, uh, uh, you know, that, you know, were applicable to banking. But I say around the same time also, there are regulations of the capital market authority, you know, regulations, you know, various regulations that came uh, all, all along with um, with these uh, laws. 
And um, I think since 20, uh, 2019, uh, 2020, 2019 also, um, maybe uh, Anthony would say more about that in terms of you know um, setting the pace for uh, Kigali International Financial Center. A number of laws were repealed and new ones came in also. So um, in, especially in the, in, in the financial uh, ecosystem. So what, what, what would that, re, uh, for example, require for a banker? You know, we have clients from, you know, different um, uh, investors in different investment vehicles. So looking at such clients, you know, there was a loan partnerships and, and this was the first of its kind in Rwanda. There was a law on trust, the law on uh, foundations. You know, there are many laws that came in that came in place. And also there are many amendments to our companies act. Uh, I know bringing in a lot of, uh, you know, elements like uh, hearing for the first time, based, uh, um, you know, special cell companies hearing for the first time elements like, uh, um, like um, uh, as, uh, a community based, uh, for example, community benefit companies and all that. So what would that require? You know, there are changes also in a number of laws. What would that require would, would be to, you know, in the first place, make some time to read. You know, um, uh, sometimes we feel that we do not have time, maybe because we do not know that we need to remain a blessed as, 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 as the, the question suggests. So if you want to remain relevant and also not shy away from any, you know, from um, any um, discussion with uh, uh, people that are informed, you need to keep on, you know, you, you know, reading and, and finding, finding time, making time, and sometimes to require sacrificing a number of things, you know, to ensure that at least you make time to, to, to read. And um, that is, that, that should be, um, the way for all the in-house councils, because if again, if you rely on the on the um, on the external lawyers, there is a possibility that may, they may not also they may not know uh, you know a number of these things, especially if they are also not you know uh, very uh, wanting to to read and find out the, what the new laws are, are talking about. So it is important also because we as in-house councils also we provide some guidance to the to the external lawyers from a from a practical uh, perspective. So if you you are an, an in-house counsel and you do not know you know what is happening, you maybe um, you cannot uh, connect you know the 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 theory with the practice and find out how the implementation of these law these laws is, is has, has started happening. It becomes difficult for you to follow up on what the um, external lawyers are doing. And sometimes they may also, I would say, maybe provide some opinion that is not very, uh, very well informed and, and very fit for, for, for consumption. So um, it is important then to um, always ensure that there is um, a follow up asking, you know, uh, you know, getting in touch, interacting with the external lawyers, asking them uh, where, how the, the new laws are put, are implemented and all that. And, you know, keeping that kind of, um, uh, that kind of stakeholder engagement and, and, and management to ensure that, you know, we do not, we are not like confined in the banking halls or in our, in our companies where we advise uh, on, on a daily basis. Sometimes it can be a routine whereby you find you are doing same things every day and you don't, you are not, you know, getting access to, you know, good thoughts and good minds on what, on what is happening. So it is always important to, to, you know, get looking at these laws and reading here and there and, you know, finding out how these laws are also uh, implemented. So that is what we, uh, what, what I was always looking at, but also one of the things that I did, uh, maybe to, to, to conclude on this, was also to find some opportunities of teaching. You know, I started, uh, you know, feeling that I, I need to teach here and there. I, I used to train internally, uh, you know, staff on every law that comes in, but also teaching um, at uh, the Institute of Legal Practice and Development is something that helped me to keep informed, you know, read a lot, you know, when you want, when you have to speak to people, at least you need to prepare, uh, you know, what you are going to say to them and, and try to also harmonize the, the theory with the practice. So that's how I managed to, um, uh, to work on that. 
Th thanks, uh, Valens. Uh, I, I see you, you're extremely versatile. Uh, and, 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 and again, I ask how, how you're able to do it, but I think it's, it's a good challenge. And, and what I wanted to pick out from that uh, you know, discussion was, you know, when you speak uh, to the issue of leveraging the networks to be able to help you to then be able to help, uh, help you to acquire that skill or to sort of bounce off, you know, thoughts or perspectives from them, then that then empowers you to be able to advise, you know, your internal uh, stakeholders. But I'm just going to sort of switch uh, a little bit into the chat. And um, I think it's, uh, it's, it's, it's a very good comment that uh, Gloria uh, Tengero has, has said about upskilling and, and, and her comment, I'll sort of read it verbatim is, uh, hi, my experience with Uncharted Waters is while it's good to upskill, we must use our positions to influence decisions on who should be in the room. When decisions are being taken, sometimes people forget that the answers to the issues uh, the company is facing lie within. And I think just to sort of add to, to, to that, uh, it also goes hand in hand in, 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 in making yourself as an in-house attorney, an integral part of the business, uh, because no one is gonna to come to you if, uh, like you said, Valence, you are sitting somewhere in a room, uh, you know, very far from the business. Many organizations right now uh, are actually insisting uh, that, you know, they want to see their, their, their lawyers sitting with the business. Uh, for some of us coming from a law firm where you had a very big office, uh, it was a very big cultural shock because all of a sudden, you know, someone sends you an email and then walks to your desk and says, have you seen my email? Uh, so being able to adjust and, and you sort of have to think on your feet. But I think the point there is, you know, how do you uh, continue to knock on that door to earn your place on the table to then be able to, as, as, as Gloria has challenged us, to be able to, uh, you know, earn or influence sort of those decisions, uh, whether you're lobbying uh, or otherwise. So thanks, Gloria, for that uh, reflection. Uh, Valence, thanks for, for that. Um, if I just sort of uh, move a little bit away from that, um, and we go into uh, to Anthony, uh, especially on the point of your ecosystem, right? And I think earlier on you spoke about, you know, um, your stakeholders, you know, the board, uh, the employees, uh, management, uh, the clients, right? So just, just pause there and maybe take out the, the, the people who are your employees or your colleagues uh, for a moment, but just, just look at the entire ecosystem um, that you are sort of required to uh, service. So Anthony, what are, what are your reflections around, you know, the extent to which, you know, you stakeholder engagement or leveraging with stakeholders um, is helpful to enable you to be able to do your job, uh, to enable you to be able to have a clear line of sight between, you know, the company's objectives and, you know, delivering the pipeline or the bottom line as, as they call it. Thank you, Chris. Um, so you've touched on uh an element that is uh, quite uh, critical in, in what we do and again, uh, uh, challenging. So ideally, it would be good to share or please or fulfill everyone's needs. Uh, that, that is the ideal position. But again, uh, I'm, I'm in the real world uh, that, that at times, uh, that's not possible. Now, when you look at uh, uh, what you'd consider you, uh, because we took out the, uh, the employees, though they're also stakeholders, uh, one, you have the shareholders. That's very critical uh, to how uh, companies navigate. Uh, you also have service providers, uh, they're also key stakeholders in um, how your uh, company moves. And you'd also, when we talked about elements of uh, uh, sustainability and climate change, you also have uh, the public out there. So when you juggle all these balls, 
ideally it's good to find that middle point, but is it uh, possible at times? Uh, yes. Uh, do you have to make a choice? The other answer is yes. Now, here where I have to guide uh, in-house counsel, good corporate governance uh, requires that all interests of the stakeholders are considered. So step number one is that whatever decision you're going to take, you should have at least considered the interests of all stakeholders. So I believe all of us, we have to follow that principle because if you've not considered interests of all stakeholders, uh, that is a fundamental mistake. Now, what happens when an interest of stakeholder A conflicts with stakeholder B? That is where the big decisions have, have to be made. Now, most of the times, the way companies are run, when you have a conflict uh, that, that you can't find a win-win situation, uh, ultimately, the decision will lie on the interests of the shareholders. Uh, those, if you look at the pyramid, definitely they'll come on top. So that's when hard decisions are supposed to, to be made. So on that element, it's important that again, as you to take in instances where you have to make a choice as a conflict, your role as in-house counsel, you should be objective in the decision that is being taken because you owe the board good advice. And one of the ways you provide good advice is to say we are taking this decision and this is it, the impact. So as in-house counsel, it would be a fundamental uh, mistake to hold back to some of this information. So one, be as uh, transparent um, as possible, have full disclosure on what the likely impact will be to the decision that will be taken. So that at the end of the day, the board takes an informed decision and at least there as in-house counsel, you would have done your work. So these are elements you find most of the time as in-house counsel, we don't um, uh, give that full disclosure or advice, and you're the key person in the room to advise uh, the board in instances where there's a conflict. So you, you would have failed uh, with your role if there is no full disclosure, so that at the end of the day, there is an informed decision. So on, on uh, matters of conflict of interest, uh, that's my take on it. It's um, it's a topic that is, um, uh, I would say, hot, and I always love uh, the interactions on it. But yeah, at the end of the day, there's a pyramid uh, where there's a conflict, and you just have no choice but to, yeah, to take the tough decisions. And that's why uh, boardrooms are considered as uh, places of uh, tough decision making. They're not just uh, rooms for uh, taking tea and enjoying, uh, you know. Uh, how the weekend was if you played golf. No, it's, it's, there are rooms for serious business. So yeah, I would want to uh, stop at that, Chris. Thanks, uh, uh, Anthony. I think that, that's very, very uh, useful uh, color. And, and, and uh, you sit on the, on the spot in, in terms of um, the discussion when people are, are probably bring it in and, and then Valence, I'll also ask you to sort of share your thoughts. Uh, Anthony, I know you've, you've, you've led teams before um, at different levels, um, and that obviously your role uh, is very much linked to the way in which you know your colleagues, uh, the people who report into you, or um, or even not, uh, sort of do their job, right? Um, and obviously, if you're looking at it from a very strategic perspective, you want to have a very clear line of sight between obviously what management is cascading down to you know, the foot soldiers to be able to have them uh, engage, uh, keep them motivated in, in obviously a very fluid 
uh, environment. Uh, you would be familiar, obviously, that you know most of of, of, of the organisations take employment engagement surveys surveys to basically see how you know their employees motivations are level of engagements and the like so you know what role uh, if if you're sitting as in house council but also you are a people leader or uh, a manager of those people uh, you know how 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 have you gone about uh, a in terms of you know providing the motivation uh, and and getting you know that whole system to fire because obviously, if you just have the one cylinder that is not firing well, that is going to have an impact uh, in the way, as a collective, uh, you execute your job. So, um, what are your what are your thoughts and reflections? How have you gone about it within the context of you know the navigating through some of these uncharted waters? Thank you, Chris. Now on. Uh how you you as a team work. One is, as any organization, company, uh, name it, it's important that you have values. Uh, these are um, pertinent in how you move forward because at times, most organizations or companies uh, assume it's about uh, bring the finance person, it's about bring the risk person, the legal person uh, to execute their role. But how do you have everyone in that one vehicle heading in one des destination? So one aspect that has to come into play, you, you have to have values uh, as an organization. And these values are not meant to just be uh, hanged up. Uh, you have to leave them. So once you have buy-in in these values, which in most organizations, uh, teamwork is very important. Uh, so it's not about you getting this done, but we are getting this done. So when you start having that kind of uh, uh, talk that everyone lives every day, it's easy to implement a couple of uh, uh, issues as a company. And again, why values are so important, as you said, once you don't have them, then if you have one person off, the whole car will just uh, get uh, derailed. So when leading um, a team, it's important to have that ownership. But again, when you look at ownership, at times it is assumed that it is you uh, uh, directing uh, those you lead. Where most of the time things go wrong is that you would expect to inform colleague A to do this, but have you taken time to understand if they get the direction that you want to get to? Do they have been buying? So as a company, especially for my case of reference, as uh, Rwanda Finance, here as a team, we, we have to have that understanding if it's a strategic goal that we have to reach, we have to develop it ourselves and again implement it. So most organizations you'll find someone developed and you're implementing, but do they understand? Because at times, uh, we assume this has failed to, to achieve the objective because maybe you don't have the skills. Maybe uh, uh, name it uh, uh, you're lazy or anything, but did you get the time to understand? Maybe this other person would have added uh, this other concept to it to make it better. So that buy-in from the onset is, is very important, and that's what uh we do here as a company and uh, execution is made easy and again when we uh that leads us to even elements of uh, uh succession when there is buying from the beginning so when uh anton is not here uh next week what can be done if chris is not in this meeting yes you won't feel that chris is not there because you have that 
uh, buy-in and, and leads to that teamwork and uh, definitely you will achieve excellence. So that, that is what I wanted to speak on uh, that aspect. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Anthony. And I like the fact of, of, of the we and not the I. Um, and also, you know, inculcating in your teams, uh, them being able to take sort of like the physical and psychological ownership of their work and, and, and being able to understand that, you know, we are an integral part of a team and, and, and you know, the, 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 it's not an individual success, but it's more or less uh, a team uh, success. Uh, that, that's, that's really, really, uh, you know, very useful color. And uh, I, our, our other panelists has come in, uh, Deborah, you're very welcome. Uh, I'll be coming to you uh, in a bit once you confirm that uh, you could hear, hear me clearly. Yes, I can hear you clearly. Great. Uh, I'll just be coming uh, to you in a bit. I just wanted to, to go back to Annabelle a little bit and uh, in terms of what's happening uh, in the chat. Uh, Annabelle, there, there are a few of my colleagues, many of them who I know have dialed in and they promised to ask questions. I, I think I'll have a very difficult discussion with them you know, after this call, uh, because I'm not seeing them, you know, write anything yet, but what's happening uh, uh, in there? I, I, I can also see that uh, we have uh, participants uh, dialing in from far and wide. Uh, I can see we have uh, participants from Austria, uh, Vienna. Uh, I know we have participants from London, uh, Kigali, um, Nairobi, or, or, or Kenya, uh, Tanzania. Uh, if, if there's any other location you're calling from that I, I could have missed, please feel free to just put it in the chat uh, because we'll be uh, touching on a discussion around leveraging technology and it's, it would be good to have those, those examples of, of to demonstrate how we're leveraging technology to be able to actually make this possible. Uh, Annabelle? Um, yes, thanks, Chris. Um, we have two hands raised. I don't know if... Um, um, they are raised by mistake, or do you have questions, Joan and John Wasco? I'll begin with Joan. Do you want to unmute and ask your question or share? Ah, uh, okay. All right, as we wait for Joan to organize herself, um, there are a few questions in the Q and A section, three to be exact. The first one being, and I'm just going to read verbatim, Weekly is asking, outside looking inside, it appears the in-house council job is blue chip. My curiosity is whether to hone the stream and streamline job demands for knowledge, skills, and experience for vertical promotion. My, my curiosity is whether to hone and stream job demands for knowledge, skill and experience for vertical promotion is a package offered as an odd as an add-on at the entry level and whether the required further training cost is to be foot by the corporate in question or otherwise. That's the first question from weekly. The second one is um, from Andrew who says thank you for a very informative webinar. How have the panelists, including Chris, Annabelle, and Gloria, been able to show value as a department? The legal department is often seen as a hurdle and cost center. How can one change this narrative and perspective? And then our very last question is from Vanessa. Um, she says, thank you all for your experiences as in-house counsels. Could you kindly advise new entrants into the corporate world who face the likes of imposter syndrome, lack of confidence, etc. at these organizations such as, as these are quite common for rookies. In addition, what advice would you share for new entrants who have who are interested in building a vast network in the legal business world without being infuriating? Lastly, can you please share your advice again? new entrants who work in organizations that lack seasonal legal minds, therefore aren't effectively guided in their legal journeys, but would like to develop in that particular organization they are, they are in. For example, working, an, working in an 
insurance firm that has a few lawyers at associate level, but none at manager and above. Vanessa's question is big. It needs to be unpacked. I think I can relate <laughs> to most of the questions. <laughs> Sure. But we'll let our, our panelists speak first and then, yeah. Sure. Um, thanks, thanks, Annabelle. Um, uh, Valenza and, 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 uh, and Anthony, I've, I've seen you taking copious notes uh, of those questions and I'll come to you in a bit. But there's one, I think, the one from Wycliffe around, I think, career progression. I think that was uh, the key one, which I wanted to, to cue in Deborah. Um, I think the question was about, I think the gist of the question is about, you know, how have you been able to progress, um, you know, through your career? Um, Whitecliff, uh, please, please drop a chat in case I have not got it well, but uh, Deborah, do you want to uh, just share your thoughts around that? Okay. Um, thank you, Chris. I hope you can hear me clearly. Loud and clear. Okay. Uh, so the question is very interesting. I think um, key for me in terms of career growth is first and foremost, you must be clear where you want to go. Um, and I find that, and, and I face the same challenges when we are young, we are not clear exactly what path we want to pursue. And we find that we take on assignments or jobs for that matter, purely because they pay our bills. So my answer to your question, my first answer to your question is you must know where you want to go. And then once you know where you want to go, then you will chart the path forward. So in terms of career growth, one thing I tell most people, um, most young lawyers is you must start from the bottom and we need to appreciate that. And then you grow gradually. There's merit in having organic growth and gradual growth, which means you grow both your knowledge and your skill progressively. So within an organization, what is important? Um, one, you need to, of course, have the basics of legal knowledge, but more importantly for me and what has assisted me is you need to understand your client. Now, corporate is different because your client is one organization. So if your client is insurance, you need to know what insurance is about. If your client is a bank, you need to know what banking is about and you know, several other examples I could give. So that counts for your growth because then you're not just giving uh, technical expertise that is um, you know, very basic. You've understood your client and you give them very relevant um, expertise. Then you're able to grow. Um, one of the, the challenges I faced while I was, if I may give myself a, as an example, is that you find that in-house departments are very small. So it therefore means that sometimes the levels through which you can rise are limited. And if that is the case, so you find in organizations which are, which are large, where the department is big, you have a legal officer, then a legal manager or an assistant legal manager, and then you grow to maybe senior legal officer and then you know, legal manager and director ETC. In a small organization, you will not have those stratified levels of growth. So it then becomes a challenge. But there are alternatives because corporates are very many. So for instance, in my case, what I did is I grew outward. When now those levels became limited, I grew outward. But you can only grow outward when you have honed a certain skill and experience which you can sell outside of that organization. And therefore, industry experience then comes into play so that you're able to move from one organization to another within the same industry. So that if it's banking, you've developed a skill that you can transfer to another organization within the same industry. I hope that answers the question. Great uh, insights, uh, Deborah. Um, if, if, if only David would accept us to extend this for another hour, would have let you uh, sort of speak to us more. Um, I think the key, one of the key things I picked up there was the aspect of, of growth compounding uh, with time um, and, and being able to start from the bottom uh, as, as, as you traverse uh, through your career. And just to sort of move to, to Anthony and, um, and, and, and Valence, probably uh, Valence, you'll, you'll, you'll take this question first. I think Andrew asked something around uh, how do we uh, 
I think in reflection to the question that, or to the comments that Gloria had shared earlier on about, you know, how do we earn our place on the table? I think that was the, really the gist of it. Um, and uh, obviously the, the example that was given there was about the view that sometimes we are looked at as short stoppers, um, you know, to, to decisions, perhaps what Anthony spoke about earlier on, inability to, to, to balance between risk uh, and reward. So, uh, Valence, uh, do, do you want to start us off on, on, on your thoughts on that? And then we can go to, uh, you know, Anthony and then back to, to Debbie. Uh, thank you so much, Chris. Um, on that question, for me, what I would say is, um, as in-house councils, and this is what I had uh, alluded to earlier, as in-house councils, we need to know um, our, com our the commercial goals of, um, of, of, of our companies, the companies we work for. We need to understand what do the shareholders need, yeah? And that is what will also be, um, uh, be reflected in what the board is, uh, you know, what the board is, you know, deciding on, and 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 what the management is doing. So the decisions will be, you know, geared, uh, you know, will be directed to the commercial goals of the company. What does the what the, what do the shareholders need? The shareholders need return on their investment. They need they they need return on equity. They need to drive uh, a business that is profitable. But, but also while you know having that at the top of their mind, they want to ensure you know that the risks involved in the business are mitigated. Uh, and, and for example, when we that when we, we are talking about the risk, they are not only risks that would lead to financial loss, but also risks that would lead to um to reputational you know issues, uh, you know, issues with the 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 the, the, the regulator if the company, if the business is regulated risk related to um uh to the stakeholders in terms of um in terms of the clients so you know all that so it, it was it would be important to to understand what, what what does the company need so that you would be able to advise like for me when i when i did uh you know like this certified professional banker i had a feeling that i did not know what banking is all about and deborah put it very right uh right, rightly that we need to understand where I want to be, but also if you want to go somewhere, you need to understand if you want to move from one bank to the other, for example, of, of, or from one insurance company to the other, they should see in you value. Like even when you go for, for, for an interview and you want to move, if you cannot grow internally and you want to grow externally, as Deborah said, you need to you need to indicate you need to to prove to the to the employer that you would add value to to their business and how would you do that they should see in you the potential to be able to advise even in terms of you know business how do you advise you know in, in, in with full consideration of um, where the business wants to be in the future what is the what about what the strategic plan of the business is how do you advise in terms of you know having the business you know productive you may be uh, advising from a legal perspective from a legal point of view but without looking at you know what does the company want for example if the company loses a customer you know you should you know look you look through you know all that so for me it is about you know loving what you what you're doing and trying to ensure that what you're doing is you know is something that you know knowing what you're doing. Like Anthony talked about, you know, uh, this ownership, you know, own, owning a business uh, or, you know, own, own, owning what you're, you, you, you're doing, it would, would require that you really know. So that um, I sometimes feel that when I wake up in the morning to go to office, I should feel that I'm not going to struggle. Like, like you know, you are in a swimming pool or you're, you know, you are in your, uh, you know, maybe playing golf. You know, you feel that you own that and you love it. So it's about ownership and loving what you do. And if you love what you do, then you do all, 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 all you can to ensure that you do it the best way. So, and this is what calls for you for upskilling, going for you know a course, you know, reading a book, you know, you know, having a discussion with a friend, you know, to, to you know to ensure that you love what you do, but also you know what you're doing. Uh, in the, in that way, when you go to a boardroom, when you go to you know advise a manager or head of department, you'll you build this confidence. 
and they also be you know pulled pu pushed pushed to you know to seek advice from you with confidence that what you give you what you will tell them is something that will add value and will bring an impact a positive impact to the business so it's all it's all about you know also building the confidence in the people that you deal with the stakeholders including you know the 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 the, the management you know the uh, you know the, your your colleagues your peers but, but also even your boss your boss should also know like someone talked about growth if you want to grow, you should also, you know, I would say you should influence your boss to like, uh, you know, know that you can manage to do A, B, C, D. And, and therefore, uh, if there is any room for growth, they will be not, they, they will not be looking for someone from, you know, out of the company, but they will be wanting to grow, uh, you know, uh, to, to grow internally, you know, and, and maybe even rotating, you know, uh, making, making it possible to have one staff uh, you know, moved for, from maybe legal to compliance or to risk management. So it is important to look to you know, know where you're going and look for, for opportunities to ensure that you can get there. Thank you. Valence, that's extremely uh, comprehensive. I don't know if you had a sight of that, of that question before it came, it came through. Um, but 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 that's 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 extremely helpful and I think you've reiterated you know the need to be able to understand the business I think that's 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 really the key uh, headline uh, in there uh, I'm just going to move to to Anthony as well and Anthony I'll, we, as we're getting to the business end of of, of, of the webinar uh, I'll just give you about three minutes and then uh, there'll be another three minutes um, then we'll, we'll we'll go and touch on to the the question around uh, rookies and and um, so, so Anthony, uh, what are your what are your reflections on on the discussion in, in just a few minutes um, on being an integral part of the business? Thank you, Chris. So, my um, commencing statement, I would say, it's um, a big miss for any organization. Or company if they don't uh, believe that the legal mind shouldn't have a seat in the decision making role. So for me, I've, I, I say this with passion because most of the time decisions can be made, but no one to guide uh, on, on the decision made. And then thereafter, you're the full guy to clean up uh, what, whatever has has gone wrong and you spend uh, uh, quite a number of uh, hours uh, to clean up what went wrong. So I believe a legal person should have a seat at any decision making, be it at the board, be it at management level. Now, on the personal level, how, how do you bring about this value? Uh, my colleagues have um, alluded to the skills, which is very important. Um, uh, I, I mentioned about uh, values. Uh, when you look at aspects to do with uh, integrity, it's also an aspect that, that someone should uh, uh, have within them to also have this uh, buy-in and you put onto that seat. Uh, because these are elements that most of the time many people don't reflect on. Sometimes you ask yourself, why am I not on that table? And maybe that's when you get the answers on why you're not on that table. Not because you know, you're not a good legal advisor, but you have something missing as well within you uh, to have you on that table. And uh, maybe if you focus on the, the practical aspect, most of the time you find in-house legal counsel has the number of uh, files you're working on and you're more or less the person who, who clocks in in the morning and uh, your door is shut and then you walk out uh, later in the evening, uh, you've done a lot of um, uh, work on your desk, but have you had time uh, to interact uh, with, uh, with uh, colleagues? Uh, have you had time to uh, interact with your supervisors to say how are things going. These are fundamental mistakes many people don't don't, uh, don't focus on, and that's where your value comes. Have you ever uh, 
uh, taken that extra mile to say, I know you're doing this, how can I be of help than you just waiting for, for, for an assignment to come on your table? Now, it's those little things that over time, that other person says, oh, I think uh, I need Chris to help me with this. Chris, can you uh, come with me to this negotiation? The next time, Chris, can you be part of this meeting? So it's not enough to do uh, that wonderful legal opinion on paper, but you know, you need that, that engagement, I would say. Reach out and say, are you okay? Do you need this? Oh, how am I doing? There's the self-evaluation aspect. Most people, I would say, uh, at times they like to hear the good, but they don't hear the bad. But it's the bad that really puts you to that level. Maybe you may not have a supervisor or your boss, name it, that will come to you, but will have those reservations Again, it's still, and maybe those are the aspects that don't bring you to the table, but if you yourself say, yes, uh, we have worked over a couple of uh, months, it's now one year, uh, what are those areas that you think as a person have to improve? I'm sure if you had a frank discussion and it was um, uh, one that needs to take you to the next level, then it won't be a question on whether you should be in that room. Uh, so those are elements we have to focus on. Many people uh, think of accumulating masters and PhDs and uh, you assume uh, that's what takes you to the next level, but you never have those chickens uh, to know those small uh, little details that may be uh, are holding you back. And once you understand them, then you work on them, then yeah, the doors will open. So that's what I wanted to really add on uh, the practicality of uh, all this we're talking about. Thank you. That's uh, very, very well uh, articulated, uh, Anthony. And, and thanks for, for sharing uh, you know, that, that really practically uh, with us. Uh, I'll just ask Deborah, uh, just in a few minutes, to just sort of share your thoughts as well on, on that specific point before then we take uh, the question on imposter syndrome. Thank you, Chris. Um, I'm just going to, without belaboring the point, I'm going to segue on uh, uh, Anthony's point. Um, he mentioned something that uh, I can use myself as an example. He said, you know, we go searching for papers um, and uh, sometimes those papers may not be relevant. Um, people, companies are looking for other skills and skill sets, you know. Um, I, for one, you know, sometimes it's good to share. I, for one, don't hold a master's degree. Um, and uh, it has never been a challenge. It has never been a handicap. You know, perhaps now that I have, and this will also be a lesson in, in building yourself and being relevant and giving value. Perhaps now that I've established myself in a specific area of in-house, then I will look at what is relevant in that space in terms of a master's. You know, so it is additional skill and value. So that is how to look at it. But more importantly is wherever you have been, you know, I'm answering the question, how do you get your seat at the table? Involve yourself outside of just the legal, the legal space. And I find that lawyers, sometimes we confine ourselves. We have this term that we use, the law says, you know, the law says this, the law says this, uh, you know, that's, we always looked at, and we are therefore sometimes looked at as, as um, you know, we, we, we bar business. You know, I can see Chris laughing because I'm sure he has been told that uh, there are enablers and disenablers and you are one of them as legal department. So when you're working in-house, you must change that narrative so that you are now seen as a business enabler wherever you are, so that you're not just here to come and tell business, this is what the law says, the law says, because sometimes the law says does not support business. So you must run together with business to see this is where the company is going and how do I support? So see yourself as a support rather than the traditional um, definition of in-house counsel where we were seen as gatekeepers. That has evolved and now we are seen as business partners. So 
you see yourself as a business partner, you then earn your seat as a, at the table by giving relevant and valuable advice. And then beyond that, um, I'll just ride on that and talk and say, you then move away from being seen as a cost center because now you're actually bringing value addition and they are seeing that without legal at this table, we actually cannot progress. That's how you, 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 you get yourself a seat at the table. Yeah. Thank you, Chris. Great stuff, uh, uh, Debbie. Um, it's very difficult to, to summarize that without you know, taking away the, uh, the, the quality of, of, of that submission. Um, we are, are obviously coming uh, towards the end of, of this discussion, but I think before we do that, we, before we exit, um, I think there's a question that I've been asked around imposter syndrome, right? So what I want to kindly ask is all the panelists to just reflect on that and sort of share their thoughts in about a minute uh, each, and then you'll also have a minute to, to, to have your parting shots. I think the question, as I understood it was about, you know, they use the word rookie, um, but, but really, you know, someone who is new to the profession or who is growing in a certain area of practice, um, you know, how do you get over issues of, of, of feeling intimidated, uh, lack of confidence, uh, as it were. Um, and then I think the, the, the word that was used was imposter syndrome. I mean, how do you overcome uh, that? Um, I think just for the benefit of, I don't remember the person who asked the question, I think imposter syndrome is not only for, for the rookies, but, but let's hear what, what the panelists have to say. So Valence, uh, in that order, you can just touch, uh, tackle that question in just one minute, and then you'll have you know, the one minute uh, being your parting shot uh, from this discussion. Thank you so much, Chris. Um, you know, about imposter syndrome, um, I would agree that it may happen to anyone that is entering into a new, a new area. When you become, you know, when you go to school for the first time, you don't know what to do. When, when, when you, you know, when you get married or you are introduced to your first, you know, to your fiance for the first time, you know, you have a feeling that you, you may not know how to relate with her or him. When you go to a company for the first time, like now I moved to NS Africa. I'm also learning like a baby. When I was telling my, uh, <laughs> when I was discussing, you know, my experience with my uh, former colleagues at EcoBank, and and they are, they were asking me, how do you find it? What is your experience? I was telling them, I'm now very humble, learning like a child. You know, you know, you're just you know trying to navigate through something the unknown. So that that is a feeling that many of us can can have. But we should not, you know, shy away or feel intimidated or feel that we, you know, um, that, that, that we, you know, we need, we need to look at where we are going in the first place and, and with the confidence, try to build in confidence, you know, in ourselves. And we know that this is something that everyone experiences. But, you know, if you sit back and say, you know, I don't know. Uh, you didn't even don't have, you know, uh, opportunities to, you know, opportunities are always there and it's important to you know, look out for them uh, and try to grab them. So it is uh, something that can happen to anyone feeling, you know, that you're going to something new, something unknown, but also building confidence, you know, uh, and, and trying to learn very quickly what, what, what you're going to do, asking questions, you know, and, be, and feeling humble uh, and feeling that there, there could be something that you not know, that something that you did not, you know, learn from school. So reading, you know, finding out from, from, from the colleagues, being simple, asking questions, you know, learning like the other philosopher that, you know, what, what, I, I, what I know is that I know, I know nothing. It's, it's important to fill the gap and try as soon as you can to, to you know, fill it. Now with feeling, sure. uh, you know, FEE, but also filling it with FI. So it is important to, you know, find out how you can get out of, out of that situation as, as soon as possible so that you don't risk remaining there. There is something that I was thinking about, you know, very uh, passionate about, and Deborah, I want to thank you for bringing this forward. You know, it is um, a common mentality that, you know, the legal department is um, a support depart department, yes, at, at the defense, but that thing has changed. I, I, I saw it over, 
the recent years. And I think it's something that we should always indicate that the legal department or the legal unit or the legal function is not you know, a cost center. It's, it's really, uh, Deborah put it very right, and I want to encourage all of us in this conversation to you know, change that mentality. Uh, otherwise, I think we risk losing our jobs. You know, <laughs> if, if, we, if we don't feel that we are you know, uh, facilitating enablers you know, uh, of the business, trying also to defend, but also on the, at the front line to ensure that we are participating and doing all that we can uh, to ensure that the business is uh, is driven to to profitability, so uh, that's what I had I, I had to do about that that, that and, and thank you, Chris. Thank you very much, uh, Valence Anthony. Yes, uh, thank you, uh, Chris. So my take this uh, was a question uh, that was asked by uh, Vanessa. So it's important. At, from the onset to really understand that uh, there are a number of um, uh, things you can learn as a person, but one thing that you have to take that personal initiative is confidence. Uh, I believe there's no school for confidence. It's, it's you to have the personal drive. Right? Vanessa, um, as we guide you on this, uh, just have that personal drive. And uh, everyone had their day one. So you have your clean page. You'll always have the second page. And finally, you'll have uh, uh, pages this thick. So you'll get there. It's a road uh, map that you have to follow. And um, one of the uh, points that I can advise is that be uh, patient and be humble. It's OK to make, to make mistakes. but it's from mistakes that uh, we learn. So as we uh, all know, it's uh, the, the measure of uh, uh, oneself is uh, uh, not how far you fall, but when you pick yourself up. So I never um, find a hado, that's the uncharted waters that we are also referring to, and uh, it pulls you back. Uh, use that as an opportunity or a springboard to move forward. So that's my take. Chris, thanks. Thank you uh, very much, Anthony. Uh, it's a marathon. As, as one of uh, my senior uh, colleagues uh, once told me many years ago, it's not a sprint. Uh, Deborah? Thank you, Chris. Um, I think imposter syndrome, I agree with my colleagues, can happen to anybody. It doesn't only happen to rookies. Um, of course, uh, what has happened is we who have been in the industry or in, in practice longer have learned you know, how to manage it. But uh, it can happen to any of us. And I'm happy to hear that I'm not the only one who is learning new things like a baby. Uh, Valence, uh, <laughs> I'm happy to hear that because I have just transitioned into insurance after about 15 years in banking. So you can imagine I run the risk of actually um, having imposter syndrome right now. But this is the way to handle it. One is uh, have contacts of people you can reach out to. I, I always say uh, networks, your network is your wealth. So you definitely know somebody. They may not even be a lawyer. It might even be your insurance agent, you know, or a friend who you know who works in insurance. Keep them close and call them when you're uncertain about something. You know, ask, don't feel like, you know, don't be too proud to ask, ask questions. And then if you know of other senior lawyers who could assist you to understand that area in terms of the legal framework, always have somebody on speed dial or two or three lawyers who, you know, are experts in a certain field who you can reach out to. Um, I always say, you know, you need to fake it until you make it. So when you go into that room, you must carry confidence and, and act like you know your stuff. It, nobody's going to ask if you called Chris to ask him what you know, the legal position is. You can go back and read later and, and, you know, and, and clarify. But always have, that's how we survive this market because it's fast paced. You might be in a fast paced um, industry where you find also that they are changing laws. Laws are changing rapidly. 
get two or three lawyers who you can always have on speed dial. That's number two. So finally, confidence. And I love what um, you know uh, my colleague said. That one nobody can do for you. There's no school for it. You must just do it yourself. Great stuff, uh, Deborah. Confidence, uh, confidence, confidence. And um, I know we we, we had a, a few more uh, questions that are on the chat, but I'm just going to kindly request that uh, uh, IT and, and also the uh, the leadership of ELS to just uh, kindly keep a transcript of all the outstanding questions that uh, have been asked by participants. Uh, I would really want to commit for us to reach out to the participants that have, uh, you know, ask those questions and just share our insights. Um, I'd like to bring uh, this discussion uh, to an end. But before I do that, I'm gonna ask all the participants uh, to just drop into that chat, you know, one or two uh, words of, of, of what some of the key takeaways or, you know, your learnings or your reflections are. And, and while you do that, uh, let, me, let me take uh, this opportunity to, um, I've been I've been guided by David. Thanks, uh, our CEO uh, for East Africa Law Society, that the transcript, transcript is going to be kept. Thanks, uh, David. So we'll be able to act uh, on that. So I'd like to take this opportunity to uh, uh, thank you know our amazing panelists for you know the elo eloquence with which they have shared you know their experiences uh, on this topic, for setting aside you know two hours of their busy schedule to be able to come and sit with us uh, and reflect. Uh, just to sort of wrap up uh, the discussion, we began uh, with a, a fiction story of Jack, uh, Captain Jack Sparrow on, 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 on reflections around uncharted waters. And then we went into business of, of reflecting on the various headwinds uh, attributed to uh, COVID-19, uh, the geopolitical tensions and their impact on the global economies. Uh, we also touched on issues of climate change and, and how as a collective, all those macroeconomic issues uh, continue to, to stretch us as in-house council, be able to reflect and do our work differently uh, or how we approach. And, and, and you know, my recollection was on discussions around upskilling, retooling, uh, using positions of influence to make decisions, new ways of working, and understanding the client's needs, leveraging stakeholder engagements uh, and the power of network. Uh, we also spoke about the growth mindset you know, being able to challenge yourself, um, to be an integral part of the business, uh, growth uh, mindset, teamwork, being a business enabler and clarity uh, in terms of your path. Again, Vanessa, thank you for the vulnerability in terms of sharing that. Uh, again, imposter syndrome is not only unique to someone who is new to the profession, uh, but again, it can appear or manifest itself in different ways. Uh, my co-moderator, uh, Annabelle, Thank you very much uh, for making the time uh, and, and also for, for the energy that you bring to the various sessions that we have. Let me also take this opportunity of thanking uh, the leadership of ELS, uh, the president and the CEO and the in-house uh, legal committee uh, led by uh, our chair, Gloria Dengerwa, for the well thought out topics that are being churned out uh, by ELS. And uh, lastly, but not least to you, uh, our participants who have dialed in from far and wide or again, being very good listeners, uh, being very active uh, on the chat throughout. Uh, Deborah talked about the power of network. Uh, please take time to look for all these uh, panelists on LinkedIn, you know, drop them a note, uh, keep in touch. You, you never know uh, where that takes you. Uh, my lines are always open, so feel free uh, to, 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 to ask me to be your friend and, and we'll engage. Uh, for those who are uh, taking holidays, um, you know, please enjoy your holiday, uh, get time to reboot uh, and refresh. Uh, myself, I am in the part of Africa and I'm looking forward to the great hospitality uh, in Uganda as I run away uh, just for a short time from the biting cold in Nairobi uh, where Debbie and the rest of my friends are. Uh, let's also in a special way continue praying for our sisters and, and brothers in Kenya. We thank God for uh, the peace and the restraint that has been uh, exercised to date. Um, and we pray that, that that continues. Without taking much time, thank you uh, once again and have a good evening. <laughs>